Good morning and welcome to worship. May the peace of Christ be with you. I feel a little today like a politician running for office, filming a commercial in my denim shirt and jeans and cowboy boots just to prove I'm an ordinary Coloradan just like you. That's not why I'm doing this. I'm filming today at Arvada Rentals. It's my favorite rental store in Arvada. If you need a tool, they've got it and it'll work when you use it. But I think it'll become clear later in the sermon while, why I'm filming at a place about work, about labor. This is a time of year when we are thinking about stewardship, how we use our resources. We're inviting you to think about how you might give to your church in 2021. There's still a lot of work to do and we can't do it without you. So hopefully you received in the mail a stewardship pledge card and hopefully you'll think over these next couple of weeks about how you're feeling led to contribute to God's work through Trinity Presbyterian Church. We'll be inviting you to return those on January 31st. Let's worship God together. I miss being with my Trinity family in person, but I'm grateful today to join you in worship. Jesus came to reveal what God the Father is like. He showed us the Father in his parables and in his life. John's Gospel reminds us just how amazing it is that Jesus should come to reveal his Father to us. Let this paraphrase of John 1 call us to grateful worship today. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, 
like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. Please join me in this prayer of praise. Gracious God, you send your anointed to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to announce release to the captives and freedom to those in prison. Such sal salvation turns sadness into joy and mourning into gladness. So we sing your praise and give thanks to you from sincere hearts for even in the midst of it, Earth's ruins, you help us to rebuild with hope. We thank you, God, for hope that comes in the form of a vaccine, for joy that comes in the form of friendships and newborn babies, for peace that comes in the form of volunteers and goodwill, for love that comes through the gift of laughter. Our trust is in you, O oh God, let us give thanks. Amen. It's a brand new song for you. Learn it with us. For the praises of man, I will never, never stand. For the kingdoms of Only a 
Jesus shows us the heart of his father in a parable about a landowner who goes to the market all throughout the day to hire laborers for his vineyard. To fully appreciate this parable, we have to imagine ourselves as people waiting at a day labor site, hoping to be hired. When I drive downtown to St. Joseph Hospital on a regular basis, I experience people standing by the side of the road, hoping for work. What's going through our minds as we wait for an opportunity to work, a chance to feed our families that night? Now listen to Jesus' parable as it addresses you. Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landover, landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Thanks be to God. Hi friends. I have a question for you today. I wonder, have you ever been picked last for a sports team before? Just even on the playground? I have. I was usually picked last for basketball or baseball or football, mainly because I'm not a very fast runner. Never have been, never will be. I don't enjoy it. And I'm usually kind of bad at catching things. Hand-eye coordination is really hard. And I don't really care if we win or lose. I just want to be hanging out around people. So when I didn't get picked first or second, when I had to wait around till the very end, I didn't feel very good about myself. It felt like the people around me were telling me that I wasn't appreciated, that I wasn't needed, and I never really felt included. And that doesn't feel good. But there have been other times where I've been picked first. Like when the teacher said that we had to do a group project and lots of people would ask to have Abby in their group or would say, I gotta be Abby's partner for this because they know that I'm fun to work with, that I have lots of creative ideas and that I make sure that others are listened to and included. And in those moments, I felt very good about myself. I felt proud, I felt wanted, and I felt important. And those are all wants that we all have, isn't it? The wonderful thing about being part of a faith community is that God picks us anytime, anywhere, and we're always the first to pick. We are always so important to God's faith community that God always puts us first. So there are going to be times where we don't feel good about ourselves, where we don't know what's going on, we don't feel included. And in those moments, maybe that happens this week, 
you can take a breath. And remember that God will always pick you, no matter what. And that is the most important opinion to have, is that God loves you and that you are God's first choice in everything. So, let's end our time with a prayer, thanking God for picking us. Let's shake out our hands so that we can focus and really listen. So we'll bring them together in three, two, one. Dear God, thank you for p picking us first, for putting us in your heart at the very top of the list. And you know that you love us so dearly that we want to make sure that we love you just as much. Be with us this week and remind us of how important we are to your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. This is a work setting, so there may be a little extra noise going on today. Jesus came to show us what the Father is like, because we just couldn't grasp what God was like without seeing God in the flesh, in Jesus. Jesus came to show us what life with God is like. Jesus called that the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. And because it's so different than we could imagine, Jesus told parables, stories, to help us grasp what that life with God is like. Jesus told parables to shake up our imaginations and help us begin to conceive it. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus describes life with God, the kingdom of God, through the eyes of a day laborer. And we find that this life with God is so different than we had first thought. In this parable about men waiting to be hired, Jesus takes our view of the world and shakes it up like a snow globe. Only this time it's not just the snow that is floating around and gonna land in different places in our snow globe. 
It's also the characters themselves, the scenes that are normally securely fastened to the bottom of the globe. They've floated loose and they're shaking around and they're going to land in a different arrangement, a different order as well. When Jesus shakes up our view of the world, principals and students, CEOs and assembly line workers, PhDs and GEDs, white collar and blue collar people all land in a different order, a different place, a different sequence to one another. And Jesus calls this, the first will be last and the last will be first. That's what life in the kingdom of God is like. That's what life with God is like. It's an upending of the way our world functions. To grasp just how different life with God is from how we normally see it, you have to imagine yourself as someone waiting for a chance to be hired. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. And we're supposed to connect God with this landowner. The story will tell us what God is like as we see how this landowner functions in the story. This landowner operates a vineyard and he needs laborers for his vineyard. So he goes to where men and women gather to be hired. In fact, he's there first thing in the morning so he can get a crew ready to work the whole day. He hires the people he can find. He agrees with them for the normal day's wage. Nothing extraordinary, just what was expected, a denarius. And then he sends them out into the vineyard to work. These are the lucky ones. They don't have a steady job, regular employment. They showed up at the day labor market hoping to get hired for the day. And they did. And they're rejoicing for this chance to work because they know that they'll be able to feed their families at the end of the day. They work with this confidence all day long, and it's a good feeling to know that today is taken care of. But there are others who didn't find work for the whole day. There always are. There are always more people looking for work than those who are hired in our world. We're not told why they weren't hired in Jesus' parable. Perhaps they were caring for their children or a sick parent and didn't get to the marketplace in time to be hired. But everyone who is currently looking for work in our country, everyone who has posted their resume on a job site knows what it feels like to have missed that perfect job because it was posted before they got there. They know what it's like to be passed over because they're the wrong age or their expertise is no longer needed or because they're looking for a certain kind of certification or because you have too many certifications and they're afraid you won't stick around. Jesus makes clear that the characters in the story want to work, but no one has hired them due to no fault of their own. They still don't have a job as the day wears on. This is our greatest fear. In spite of our desire to work, in spite of our need to provide for our family, we're afraid that we won't find a job. We're afraid that we'll be watching others get hired while we still wait for an opportunity that never comes for us. Millions of Americans are living with this fear every day. This is a very timely story for Jesus to tell. And now we come to our first surprise in the story. There appeared to be an abundance of jobs in this landowner's operation. Jobs for people of all skills and abilities. Jobs for anyone willing to work. Jobs for those who've given up hope of ever being hired. And Jesus is saying, this is what our God is like. It's a surprise. 
And even though the landowner has hired a crew at the beginning of the day, the first pick, the cream of the crop at dawn, he's back again at 9 a.m. He's looking for more laborers. And hopes begin to soar for those who miss that first hiring wave. Because the workday's already begun, he can't offer them the usual customary wage for the day, a denarius. He just promises to pay them what is right. He promises to be right by them at the end of the day without being very specific. And because beggars can't be choosers, they hop into the back of the pickup truck and trust that it'll all work out at the end of the day. Not only that, this landowner keeps going back to the marketplace, looking for anyone wanting to work. No one's left out. No one's left behind. No one's left unemployed. We can tell because he's there again and again throughout the day. At dawn, at 9, at noon, at 3 p.m., at 5 p.m., just before the day is over, just when someone could only work an hour in that day. The kingdom of heaven is like an employer who has a job available for everyone. Our God is a God who restores hope and dignity to everyone who has lost both because the world hasn't worked right for them. And our God is relentless in searching for those who need that hope and dignity. He's like a Marine who leaves no man, no woman behind. He could have stopped looking for those who need work, but as long as there is daylight, God, the landowner, is out looking for those with nothing to do offering them a job, promising to pay them what is right. We learn with God, everyone has value. Everyone is needed. Everyone should have the opportunity to put something on the table for their families at the end of the day. And it's as we come to the end of the day, we come to the second surprise. When it's time to be paid, those who worked less than a full day, those who worked without a contract, without an agreed upon amount to be paid, just a promise to do what is right, they receive a paycheck for a full day's work for an entire 12 hour day. Whether they worked nine hours or six hours, three hours, five hours, or one hour, they all got a denarius for a whole day's work. This is what the landowner believed was right. This is what God believes is right. Those who work less than a full day got paid first, and those who were hired first got paid last. And they watched the generosity of the landowner they assumed that since he was being so generous with these others who worked less than a full day and got a full day's wage that when it came to them, those who had worked from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., that they would be blessed with even more. If we were them, that's what we would have been thinking too. Because that's how our world works. That's the rules of the game in our world. And it, makes sense to us. The gifted and those who work hard are rewarded. That's the rule. And if you're gifted and you work hard, you have the confidence that you can earn a living. You trust that you can land on your feet if you lose your job. You won't need to dig ditches or beg like our character in last week's parable. We want that rule to be true. We don't want to worry about our security. But there are always many, many people for whom the rules of the game don't work, like in Jesus' parable. Many whose gifts are not chosen, many who are not hired due to no fault of their own. When those who had worked their full day 
received their pay and it was just the normal customary day's wage. They complained. We worked the entire day. We burdened from sun up to sundown in the heat of the day. But you have made us equal with them who only worked a part of the day. Well, the landowner confronted them. He said to them, I paid you what we agreed upon. What he didn't say was, you had the privilege of knowing all day what you would have earned. You had the certainty all day that you'd be able to feed your family at night. Those who worked on just a promise that I would do for them what was right have received what I think is right. He did go on to say, I've done you no harm. Take what belongs to you. But are you envious because I'm generous to others? Jesus is telling us in his kingdom, in his life with him, it is right. It is right for those who have the gifts and the opportunity to work all day and to be paid what they've earned. That's right. He's telling us for those who desire to work but who are not hired, it is also right that they have enough. These are the rules. This is what is just in the kingdom of God. Can you see how Jesus is taking our world view and shaking that snow globe hard so that everything's coming down in a different order? This is what God is working for in our lives and in our world. This is what Jesus is asking us to work for as well, that all might work as they are able and be paid, but that all might also have enough regardless of how much they can work. This really rattles our world. It shakes things up. It's not me, it's Jesus. And it seems to me that this is what he wants us to hear. I invite you to ponder this parable of Jesus as you are a steward of yourself. Do everything you can to work, to improve your skills, to be able to hire, be hired, and have the knowledge that you are accomplishing your needs for the day, that is right. Do that. If in spite of doing all you can to be hired, to be gainfully employed, to be fully employed for your gifts and skills, be a steward of your dignity and hope, knowing that God is for you knowing that God is working so that you might have enough. Steward that hope. Trust that God has your back and your dignity. I encourage us to be thinking about how we can be stewards of our society, assuring that all who are able have access to work, to jobs, to agency, to be able to provide for themselves but also to be able to assure, just like Jesus does, that all have enough. Those are the values that we as Christians can bring to the table when we're discussing how to care for one another as a society, as a nation. And then I invite you to be thinking about how you'll be a steward of what you have. You see, the fault of these who were hired all day, so they didn't care about others having enough. And Jesus invites us to care about that. And we're inviting us to consider how we'll use our resources, our resources, to make sure that those in our world have enough. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you see the world differently than we do. But you invite us to look at our world through your eyes. 
to find our value, to know that we're needed, to know that you care that we have enough. We are so grateful for that. We pray that your spirit will allow these words, to, words, your parable, to shake up our world, how we see it, and what we care about. We pray that we can find ourselves working with you on the things you work for in this world to help people experience what life with God is meant to be. Help us to be agents of that change. And Lord, we train our thoughts and our work and our life together using the words you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Giving, loving, serving. That's what I had in mind when I wrote this little chorus. Join with me. This is why we give. This is why we serve. This is why we lay down our lives for those who haven't heard. All because you gave, all because you died, all because you laid down your life, the perfect sacrifice, this is why we Friends, it is with the opportunity to partner with God in the world that we send you out. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being there. Christ lives in you and there's something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in the grace and love and power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.